Okay, I'm gonna start. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight for our Speaking of Nature series. My name is Ali Esposito, and I'm the Conservation Education Outreach Coordinator at Mueller. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mueller Field Station, we are part of Finger Lakes Community College, and we are located in the beautiful Southern Honeyway Valley. Um, a few things that we do here at Mueller, uh, we have Finger Lakes Community College conservation courses that take place here. Uh, we have a K through 12 program, and then we host other community uh, programs and workshops. So I do hope in the near future, you're able to come visit us here. So our, a couple of announcements, our next Speaking of Nature webinar is scheduled for uh, March, Thursday, March 25th at 6 p.m. And this presentation is going to be on hellbender salamanders, which is an endangered Eastern salamander species. So that should be pretty interesting. I love salamanders. Um, there will be an event posted to our Facebook and Instagram accounts. So you can follow us on those platforms and get updates and registrations or links for those um, to register for those programs. Um, I'd also like to mention that if you've missed any of our previous Speaking of Nature events, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. So it's just Mueller Field Station. That's the YouTube channel. And you can watch any of those past um, presentations. We also have some other videos on there that might be of interest to you. So we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you in advance. Um, all right, so on to Paul. Um, joining us tonight is Paul Brock, and thank you very much for being here, Paul. Uh, Paul is an <laughs> Paul is an associate professor of viticulture and wine technology at FLCC, and he's also the co-owner of Silver Thread Vineyard, which is located in Lodi, New York. Um, he has been teaching at FLCC for ten years and has truly made the viticulture program the success that it is today. Paul is driven by his desire to learn about and know how to explain classical and cutting edge techniques useful to small scale winemaking and vineyard operations. Um, his current interests include developing and practicing bio-intensive viticulture techniques, which reduce synthetic pesticides um, while focusing on regenerating soil health. Um, Paul is an awesome human being. And before I pass it over to you, um, I just wanted to mention that you are free to um, submit questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, whatever you're seeing on your screen. And we will periodically stop to um, take some of those questions. So, with all of that being said, um, I'll pass it to you. Great. Thank you, Allie. I'm just going to improve my audio a little bit here because I have technology. But now, tell me something I can't hear. But welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, and I do love explaining winemaking and viticulture. And I hope by the end of tonight, um, I will have accomplished a little bit of that for you guys through the lens of some of the past growing seasons we've seen in the past decade. I want to talk a little bit about how some of these things we've seen in the past decade have been fueled uh, by climate change, but who knows? Uh, we assume it's climate change uh, and what that really means. Um, so I'm going to come back to that uh, throughout the evening. So I am Paul Brock. Uh, I've been at FLCC since the beginning of the Viticulture and Wine Technology Program. I was there at the conception of this beautiful building you see on the screen right now. And um, I'm not going to really talk about the building tonight. So we're just going to talk about what we talked about in the building. And then, of course, my wife and I have owned Silver Thread Vineyard since 2011. So there was one year I was at FLCC where I didn't have Silver Thread. And uh, I actually started at FLCC in 2010. Uh, so I'm really lucky to have uh, be part of Silver Thread too, and it's not often where I get to talk about both my experiences at Silver Thread and my experiences at Finger Lakes Community College 
and interweave them together because um, most people see me at one place or the other, and uh, rarely does the public get an opportunity to see me really talk about my life, which is both. Uh, so it's exciting for me. It was exciting to go back and kind of pick and choose uh, what I was going to talk about uh, tonight. So thank you again, Allie. Uh, really excited to be doing this. And um, let's see if I can get my computer to behave. There we go. So we're going to really focus on six years of the past decade. Uh, 2018, 16, and 20, 14, 17, and 19. And we're going to group them like that. So we're going to talk about 18 by itself. Um, and then the other two and three years together. And you'll understand uh, as we go along that the conversations and the thought processes uh, that I was having during those times were similar. So in 16 and 20, we had similar um, ideas about the growing season and the winemaking, and we had similar conversations with the students. Uh, where in 14, 17, and 19, those conversations were all very similar also. And I guess really the, the foundation of this talk is that every year uh, we're experiencing different weather and that weather uh, impacts how the grapes grow and how the wine is made and the different issues that come up. Uh, so these are years that are similar and 18 is by itself. Uh, you're gonna see really quick why I put 18 by itself. Uh, we're really going to focus on um, grouping these years in terms of warmth and water. And I, I'll be honest with you guys, I talk about this stuff all the time. Not just at FLCC, but I talk about it at Silver Thread um, to my customers. Uh, so uh, I did invite all of you guys to have a bottle of uh, Finger Lakes wine with you tonight. So I, maybe you can share in the chat what you actually have and what you're sharing. Um, or what, uh, what you're having. I'm having a bottle of uh, 2019 uh, Silver Thread Dry Riesling. I actually had a bottle of, oh, 2018 Riesling from FLCC picked out for tonight, but I left it in my office at the Viticulture Center. So I had to settle for Silver Thread wine, which is, you know, I'll live. What's up? We're good. Uh, so anyways, uh, without further ado, um, I'll go and... Some of you who might know me know that I like to go into tangents, so I don't want to leave anything totally unexplained. I do want to give a shout out to uh, one of my colleagues at FLCC and a longstanding relationship I've had. Uh, the labels that you see on the screen are FLCC labels. Uh, they're all student design labels. Liz Brownell is a faculty member in that department, uh, in the design department, and her students every year each create a label, and our students in the viticulture program pick which label is going to go on the bottle. Uh, so you see some of those uh, selections from the past 10 years, uh, and I'm always really excited about that. And I was wondering, what do I, what picture do I put on this page? And I was like, this is the perfect picture to put on this page. So I just wanted to give a shout out and to show you guys. And we are currently working on the 2020 label. In class, we had a meeting about that yesterday. So. Uh, that is a continuous conversation every class has. Um, it's different artwork, it's a different artist, but we always have to put a label on a bottle. So label is always a discussion. So I wanted to start with 2018. Uh, it doesn't pair well with any other vintage, uh, but I will tell you, this is actually not the best photo. It is a photo out the front door of my house at 6 a.m on August 14th, 2018. Uh, this moment in time, uh, I don't know what possessed me to grab my phone, uh, also coincided with the first class I ever canceled at FLCC. It was actually the last class of the 2018 summer internship class. So we have um, classes all throughout the summer in the viticulture program. Uh, where students do an internship, and we have class sessions where we talk about what everybody's doing in the internship, and we do field trips. And this day, August 14th was, of 2018, was supposed to be the last field trip day. I woke up at oh, a little bit before 6 a.m., and I do what I do every morning. I make coffee, I let the cat out, and it's the middle of summer, the cat's always dying to go out, 
And I remember we were supposed to get about an inch of rain that night. And I opened up the door to let the cat out, and the cat did not go out. I knew it was raining, uh, but I looked out, and this is what I saw. And I looked at the road in front of my house and thought, wow, that looks like a stream. And I walked out to take this picture, and I had water up past my ankles on my front yard, which is sloped in two different directions. Um, so something really odd was going on. I didn't know if the road was still there at this point in time. Uh, and I immediately called off my class. So there's a, <laughs> the first mention of FLCC in this talk is me canceling class. Um, an hour later, uh, I went down to the winery. This ravine um, was actually empty the day before. It was bone dry. You couldn't find a drop of water in it. Uh, the surface of that water is about 10 feet above where uh, the bottom is at this point. And to say that this was a transformational event uh, for the landscape around the winery is an understatement. Uh, as we pan around here, I don't know, I, I just got lucky to take this video in slow motion. I usually don't take videos in slow motion. This is, if you've ever been to Silver Thread, this is actually the driveway coming down to the winery. There was not ruts in the driveway the day before, but notice as we pan away. So this is about an hour, about 6 a.m. when I took the first picture, it was like the peak of what was going on, uh, of this rainfall event. And um, this, so this is about an hour later, but you can see that this debris, let's see if I can uh, draw on my screen, I, I know I can. This is cool. See, this debris here was not here the day before, all that. And then uh, we'll pan around and we'll start to see the vineyard here. My friend who drove me down, I was a little bit panicked. And this is the debris field. Oops, what just happened? I didn't want to do that. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to watch this again. It's only a second. So the, as we pan around to the vineyard, you'll see the debris field um, where the water was before. And uh, I should be able to make this happen. Sorry, guys. Uh, anyways, it is, we're going to do this. Here we go. It was a major event. And a couple of things I want to point out with this video, besides what I've already pointed out, is as we pan around to the vineyard, I can point those things out. Uh, this was a transformational event about how we talk about 2018. Uh, and a lot of the conversation that we'd be having for the next 12 months, and in a lot of ways, we're still having the conversation in the Finger Lakes about what exactly happened on this day. So here you go. At some point earlier in the day, the water was all the way in the vineyard. Um, somehow it moved this large branch <laughs> into its current place. Um, and I mean, I was finding all sorts of stuff down the hill from this. Uh, I'll point out in my vineyard here, um, and this we'll, we'll come back to this several times, how there's grass underneath my vines. And this is something that we do down here at Silver Thread. And on this particular day, it saved me a lot of work. Uh, we have that grass under the vine that holds the soil in place. And just over this knoll that you're looking at, uh, just over the top of this, is another swale where we had uh, surface flow on this day. And we didn't lose any soil in there. Now, one of the things that all of the neighboring vineyards were doing in 2019, and actually some of my students who were working for some of the neighboring vineyards uh, did during the summer, was replace ruts that appeared during the vineyard, uh, during this event on August 14th. So we'll finish this video, it's almost over. So this is a defining moment in Finger Lakes history here. Uh, you're seeing in progress, I will get rid of this annotation when I move on. Uh, so this is what happened. I'm going to show you several, um, several uh, weather data uh, that will help me explain a little bit of what happened. Uh, so I told you about temperature and rainfall for these years that we're talking about. Temperature in 2018 was not um, much to brag about. The blue lines here, over here, let's see, I've got the blue lines are 2018, the red lines are the average. 
And you can see that the temperature it was warmer, then it was cooler, then it was warmer, and then it continued to be warmer. Uh, and then down in the monthly rainfall, we were basically below rainfall for the year. We we're, were pretty much in a drought situation going into August that year. And really, we didn't get much rain even before this August 14th event. Uh, for the rest of August, it basically rained. Uh, and we, we got some, quite a bit of rain for the rest of the year, but not too much more than we would expect. But it was this event, this major event on August 14th. And let me show you what that looked like in real time. These are rainfall data around here. And then three miles away in Dresden as the crow flies. And I think Geneva even got less. Uh, and keep in mind, when I was going through this, when I canceled class, and when I was seeing all this destruction from the, the rainfall, I thought the entire Finger Lakes was, was experiencing this too. I didn't realize that it was really lo localized uh, within a couple miles of where I was. Uh, but the story doesn't end there with this major rainfall event where we actually got 11 inches at Silver Thread that day uh, in a matter of six hours. Um, let's see, where are we going here? Trying to use all the bells and whistles of the technology. This is really what the story was. Um, so these are different airports and showing the relative humidity. And I do have to give a shout out to my colleagues at Cornell and Cooperative Extension, uh, Tim Martinson, Chris Berling, Hans Walter Peterson made all these graphs. I just stole them. So, you know, best form of flattery is stealing things from people. I told them that I was using them um, and I have ci proper citations at the end here. Um, but they do this great, uh, if we're raising the harvest newsletter throughout the season, it's for the industry. And at the end of the season, they do this summary of what happened that year and why we experienced the things that we experienced. And they make these great graphs. So when I knew I was going to be talking about this, normally I just explain it and ask my audience to take it for granted. Uh, but in this case, I thought, hey, I've got visuals. I'm going to show people. So this is a relative humidity at all of these airports in 2018 in August, um, June, July, and August for regions of New York. And you can see in all cases, it's a record. Uh, we've never seen relative humidity in August um, and September that we have seen since before 1950 when records were being kept. So this is uh, truly a landmark event. I'm gonna move this. See, Bruce Gilman is on. Hi, Bruce. Bruce actually used to try and recruit me for these chats. I live so far away from you. I was like, I don't know, Bruce. Bruce, I'm doing it now. I was thinking about you when I was preparing this. Um, so this is uh, Pen Yan and just how much more uh, relative humidity and then the dew point, how many hours we spent with a dew point above 70. So what does this mean? It was wet. It was humid. And this extended from August through September. So this rain event was just the beginning of what would really define 2018 as a year and really define the conversations that we would have as students and as an industry for a long time now. Um, and then on top of all the humidity, you think, well, if it's sunny, it's not so bad because the sun will will dry everything out. Well, you can see down here at Penyon Airport, it was also the cloudiest year um, in August and continued to be cloudy after that too. So we got the cloudiest and the most humid year after one of the, well, it was the most significant rainfall event in the Finger Lakes since 1935, which was also a very significant event for land forming here at Silver Thread. Uh, so in our lifetime, nobody's ever seen an event like that. And then nobody's ever seen this high of a humidity. So what, that, what does that mean? Well, let's see here, get my control back. I remember having class one night. It was still in September and it was before I really wrapped my head around what was going on. We had had the rainfall event. I'd spend weeks after that really recovering from that. Uh, my community spent a lot of time recovering from that. Um, just moving land back to where it was supposed to be or finding new land to put in places, moving gravel. Um, 
it wasn't until mid-September that the um, enormity of what had happened and what was going on really sunk in. Uh, we had had our first classroom discussion in that class I was telling you about before uh, for the fall. So that we have the summer class, and then we have the fall class. In the fall class, we talked about winemaking. In the summer class, we talked about grape growing. So I canceled the last grape growing class. We had this mid-September class, and we were talking about stuff going on. And nobody brought it up, but one of my students did something that no other student had ever done, but uh, and has never done since. Uh, and they left a note on my chair in my office. My office is often unlocked. And the, the note said, have you seen the Riesling and X Vineyard? I'm not going to name X Vineyard. I don't, don't need to talk about them tonight. Uh, but it was a vineyard that I get grapes from, I'm very familiar with, and I'd been in many, many times throughout the summer. And this is what that vineyard looked like. And I thought it was funny because Allie asked me for some pictures uh, to advertise this event. And I sent her a bunch of bad grape pictures because that's one of the things I want to talk about. I did send her some good grape pictures too, but she chose the bad grape pictures. I think one of these might be one of the ones that she chose, which is just kind of funny. Bad grapes, to an untrained eye, might look like good grapes. But all the dark brown stuff um, in here, and over here is all basically rotten grapes and the nice green looking stuff in this area. Here, I'll point out the, the good grapes. Um, here's some good grapes. Oops, why not drawing? There's some good grapes. And on all the other clusters, oh, here's another good cluster over here. But basically on all the other clusters, you're seeing rot. So there's not a single, oh, here's a good cluster. Uh, there's some rot in that cluster too. And this is the bad kind of rot. Some people might think about botrytis and think, oh, you can make good wine out of that. This is sour rot is what we call it. It tastes like vinegar and it smelled like vinegar. And this one particular vinegar that the student left a note about, it was basically all rotten. And, and then I, you know, I started going to other vineyards and seeing basically the same thing. This is Riesling, by the way. Um, and it was not a good thing. It, since Riesling is our thing for the region, uh, in terms of vinifera white grape varieties, um, this was kind of not looking too hot. So really the conversations within the winemaking class quickly went from, hey, when are we going to be harvesting to, huh, this doesn't look good. Uh, so one of the other things that the, the grapes did besides rot, a lot of them rotted, not all the grapes rotted, um, they didn't ripen very well. For some reason, and to this day, uh, other academics uh, don't really can't really explain. There's some good theories out there, um, and, and I guess the best theory is that the relative high relative humidity uh, prevented the grapes from respiring well, and therefore couldn't photosynthesize and accumulate sugars. And so we had acid degradation, which is a uh, function of temperature, but sugar accumulation is a function of sunlight and metabolism of creating more sugars. And that just wasn't happening in 2018. So we got to mid-September and while the acids continue to go down, we just had a bunch of rot and we had the amount of sugar that we had and especially Riesling. And some of the other varieties behaved differently, I should say. Um, but we had that experience. Um, here we go, figuring this out. Okay, here we go. So here's the students and you might ask, how do we make good wine in a year uh, that is this challenging? And that's not how, how, how I would def define 2018. Challenging, it was not a lost cause. Uh, but what the students are doing there uh, are sorting grapes. So we dump them out on this table and we sort through them. Uh, at Silver Thread, we sort in the vineyard, so we only pick the good grapes. Uh, but this is what we do. And these are the group and uh, this, what a great group of individuals to go through such a challenging vin vintage with. Uh, so I remember thinking the entire time when every day the relative humidity was high, it was really warm out. And it, of course you can see in both of these photos taken on very different days, it was always cloudy in 2018. Uh, so uh, that was what we're doing in 2018. Here is uh, a friend of mine, Will. He's at uh, Eagle Crest over on uh, Hemlock Lake. 
And I just threw that in to show you guys that one of the things we do with our students is go to other wineries and you'll see some other, some pictures of other wineries. So Eagle Crest is a relatively small vineyard and uh, they made pizza for us. It was a really good day. The students really loved that trip. Uh, Will's an outstanding person. So uh, moving on, we got more photos about 2018, if I could make it happen. I will progress the slideshow, I promise. Here we go. So I showed you the integrated pest management in a neighboring vineyard. Here's our integrated pest management at Silver Thread. It was the last year that we really did a full-on integrated pest management approach before moving into a fully biointensive approach. Uh, these grapes look much better than a lot of the, I mean, not to say nobody else had grapes this nicely. This is all Riesling, uh, and this nice in the Finger Lakes, but it was challenging to get grapes this nice. And I was thrilled that our integrated pest management program here was able to accomplish this. Because really the whole time I was waiting for these grapes to rot. Uh, these weren't picked to the end of uh, late October, I would say. And the other grapes that I was showing you before had to be picked basically by October 1st. Uh, so this is integrated pest management. And this is biointensive. Um, Riesling here at Silver Thread. And these were basically the cleanest Riesling I've ever seen. Uh, these grapes were not managed with any conventional pesticides. Uh, were managed with a 100% biological spray program. And not a lot of people are doing this. Uh, and getting these results in 2018 uh, made me really kind of lean into this and say, this is something that we can do. And we need to figure this out uh, however, I will also say the Reds had more of a problem in 2018. We actually discovered a new pest. Um, this is also biointensive fruit. So as I, I can go here, oh, it was all great. Silver thread, we know how to do this. Uh, I'm also gonna be honest with you guys because I'm an educator. It's not always perfect. Um, and in this case, you know, there's pruning or uh, picking shears in my hands and we had to pick this bad part of the cluster off and just keep the nice part. And we lost a lot of fruit uh, in our uh, Bordeaux varieties that year, but we worked hard. Uh, we got rid of the bad fruit, just like the other uh, integrated pest management vineyards had to do when they were picking, and we made good wine. Um, and it, a few quotes from the industry that I know my, my students were, were, you know, students every year, they only get one year at FLCC making wine. So they don't really know about the other years that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. But I just remember feeling so bad for them for having like this one year, but at the same time, so happy for them to have this one year that was such an educational opportunity. Uh, one grower said to me, uh, one of the growers that I worked with, Donna Gridley, she says, you know, Paul, we worked harder this year than we've ever worked before. And we got less than we've ever gotten before. And I think, that summarizes the vintage perfectly. And another thing was said by Mark Wagner, who's the owner of Lamar Landing. He said to me, you know, Paul, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've never seen a vintage like 2018. And I know I'll never see another vintage like 2018. And that's such a beautiful thing about the Finger Lakes is that every year is different. And I hope and I, I say this on behalf of the wine industry, that we never see a year like 2018 again. Um, that, that anomaly of that high humidity and the cloud cover really wreaked havoc on us and made us work so hard and we lost so much, but we were able to persevere and make some really good wine. So if anybody's drinking a 2018 wine out there, cheers to that winemaker that you guys are enjoying that wine right now and the vineyard managers who pulled through some good grapes um, that year. So, um, that being said, uh, before we move on to 2016 and 2020, I just want to know if there's some questions. So I will. Allie, Allie are there any questions? She's got to unmute herself. I'm going to have a sip of wine. Um, no questions that I see, but okay. Gina asks, actually, there is one. Gina asks, are you going to write a book about 2018? LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think I'll just have a lecture series on 2018 alone. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but 2018 is one that we always talk about, and uh, I'll come back to it towards the end of the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. But 
it is what it is. So if there are, Allie, do you have a question? Nope, no questions okay. right now. Great, I will turn off my audio so I can't hear you and then you can hear me better. So. Okay. 16 in 2020. Um, yes, so as opposed to 2018, both 2016 and 2020, sunny, warm, and dry. And I love to quote Hans on this one because he said, <laughs> he said it in the, that final report and I, it always sticks with me when I think about 2016. 30% chance of rain tomorrow. It never rained in 2016. And then we got to 2020, basically the same thing. Um, you know, before I get too far into 16 and 20, I just thought John question. Allie, can you tell me what Jonathan's question was? Yes. How do you think climate change will impact the Finger Lakes region relative to other wine growing regions, specifically compared to California? Right. So uh, I'm happy to be in the Finger Lakes as opposed to California. I'll put, I'll say that. Um, however, it's really scary. And I think actually it's something I wanted to mention about 2018. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, this is an example of what climate change really, 2018 is, is an example of what climate change really means to the Finger Lakes. It means extremes and more frequent extremes. Um, almost all of the example, well, the first two examples I picked, 2018 and then this pair of years, uh, have extremes that we've never seen before. And we don't know if we're going to see them. We know that our average temperature is going up, uh, which is good for grape growing, but we can still get cold swings in the winter, which is not something I'm going to be talking a lot about tonight. But wintertime freezing temperatures is really, if our grapes freeze in the winter, we don't get a crop in the summer. Uh, so that's an extreme that uh, we have seen recently in the winters of 13 and 14 and um, 14 and 15, especially, it was super cold those years. And then, you know, it's just, I never imagined that relative humidity would be an extreme that we saw. Cloudiness I could see, but relative humidity, but that's a thing and it really affects how our grapes grow. Um, so California is gonna more than likely get too hot to grow grapes in their best wine growing regions. The Finger Lakes are at, is at the very cool side of the, um, ability to grow grapes. So as we warm up on average, we're still going to be in the sweet spot, but it's the extremes that scare me. How more, how often are we going to have to deal with hail in the summertime, which can kill the crop? How often are we going to have to deal with years like 2018? That's something different other than relative humidity and cloudiness. And how are the vines going to reflect it? Uh, so I'll talk more about that, but I think that's, that's good for now. Um, the better audio and 2016 and 2020. So 30% chance of rain tomorrow. And you guys all remember 2020. Maybe you don't remember 2016, except that it was super nice all summer. But I mean, 2016, we're in a serious drought. Um, and here's as best I could to represent this to you. So on the upper left here, I have the summertime temperature. So growing degree days is a way that us farmers and especially grape growers measure the amount of warmth we get above 50 degrees and that 50 degrees is uh, the temperature at which grapevines start to grow uh, or are active. Uh, so growing degree days, you can just look at that and say, that's how warm it was. Uh, so on average is the red in 2016, you can see that we were warmer the entire summer, every month, except for April, uh, we were warmer in 2016. And then in 2020, sorry about the color change here, uh, is the blue. And again, May was cool, which was interesting. And it's an anomaly about 2020. Um, but every month was warmer except for September and October, but really the driving force behind any vintage gets us into September. So a lot of the vintage is dictated before the end. And this is what's important is all this warmth leading up to the end and the it wasn't like it was cold after, it was just cooler than normal. Um, so, okay, it was warm. Uh, we actually have a graph here comparing 2010 and 2020. 
And in the end, uh, I'm not, I think 2016 ended up a little bit cooler than 2020. Um, and then you can see how much higher 2016 was than the average. Similarly, 2020 was pretty high, high compared to the average too. And this is their rainfall. So the red is average. <laughs> this, I don't really have to look at the color. Um, and the blue is 2016. And I have a little bit different way of representing 2020. It's a difference. These two graphs here are, um, I'm sorry, these two down here are difference. Are they, the total accumulate, oops, didn't mean to do that. Sorry, the total accumulation throughout the season. So basically from April through October. And you see the only reason why 16 had much rain at all was this event in October. It generally got, I think, in Lodi, where I'm grow graves, about seven inches. Um, similar in 2020, we did not get a lot of rainfall, where the average, you know, by the end of the season, we're getting 23, 22. In both years, we're well below 16 at the end. And I mean, in 16, we're down around 10 inches. And like I said, it was even lower here. And, this is kind of the story with rainfall in the Finger Lakes, and a lot of you might know this, is that you start off in Geneva and you drive to Watkins Glen and it might be wet in one place and not in the other, or dry in both Watkins Glen and Geneva and not in between. And going from Geneva to Canandaigua to Honeywai, the weather changes here. So where rain falls, it varies greatly, but in general, 2016 was just dry. 2020 was dry. 2016, we had a bona fide drought going on. Um, this is an interesting graph for 2020, just the acute, the difference in rainfall from average and just how, as the season went on, we got further and further away from the average precipitation that we normally have. So it was dry, it was sunny, it was warm. I mean, for hum us humans, this is great. Uh, for crops, it was a little bit different story. Um, for 2020, I think that we got when we got the rainfall, we got it at the right time. We can see in 2016, we just didn't get the rainfall. And I remember with the students just kind of joking, you know, it's just beautiful. It's going to be beautiful tomorrow. It's, you know, there's no change in the pattern of weather that we're experiencing right now. And you can see a little bit different how we process grapes. Um, a picture I showed you from 2018, it took those students a couple hours to process about a third of the grapes that are in this bin. It took these guys 15 minutes to dump that bin and look through the grapes and take out the grapes that they didn't want to go into their wine. Um, so it's remarkable when you have a challenging vintage like 2018, what you have to do versus a challenge like a, a vintage like 2016, where we don't have the disease pressure because we don't have the humidity, we don't have the water falling out of the sky, and we don't have the cloud cover. We have sunshine, we have dryness, and we have warmth. So dryness, warmth, sunshine, those all detract from disease formation, rain, humidity, cloud cover, all promote disease. And that affects our crop. And it affects how we talk about it. And I remember in both 2016 and 2020, we could basically harvest whenever we wanted. And I, the odd part of 2016 is there was a, difference in experience that students had depending on where the grapes were coming from at their internships. If their internships were on deep soiled sites where the vines could explore the soil and their older vines, those vines loved 2016 because they had access to a lot of water because their roots could explore. Versus uh, more shallow sites like Silver Thread, the vines or even younger vines that don't have a root system, the vines we're having drought stress for a lot of the summer. When vines undergo drought stress, they don't undergo photosynthesis, they don't grow, they don't accumulate sugar. Um, so here at Silver Thread, we had an issue with getting sugar in our, in our grapes because the vines were just kind of shut down because it was so cool, but places like Anthony Road where the students have their vineyard, um, where the FLCC shares a vineyard with the uh, Finger Lakes Cooperative Extension and Anthony Road, those grapes are fine. There's 10 feet of topsoil up there. Here at Silver Thread, I've only got like average two feet of topsoil and, uh, or just soil to, down to shell. So very different experiences from one place to the other. Some places getting really high sugar accumulation, meaning a lot of photosynthesis, healthy vines, or happy vines, I should say. 
and other places were getting solid sugar accumulation. So I remember picking some of my recently and going, geez, there's not a lot of sugar in this. And students coming in going, oh, we had all this sugar in our, in our grapes. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. Uh, but the flavors were there um, and they're different. The flavors will always reflect the vintage. And I just wanted to point out a few things that we did, you know, Here's us processing grapes. Uh, this is 2020 and this is 2016 actually. Great vintages. We basically picked grapes when we wanted to in both of those years. 2016, um, the, one of the owners of Fulbright had passed away and this is a team of students from both FLCC and Cornell uh, that went out there to help prune the vineyard and did, did a little bit of uh, community service. And I just always love that picture because um, it reminds me of of that day, it was fun. And uh, Bully Hill sent lunch. Uh, Greg Taller was one of our students in this group. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, there's Greg, he's right in front there. So Greg Taller is the son of Walter Taller, who was the founder of Bully Hill. Um, and then here we are out at a ravines vineyard uh, in the summer of 2016. Of course, in all of these pictures, this is actually a sunny sky. It just didn't come out very well on my camera, but it was beautiful. It was always beautiful in 2016 and 2020. Actually, this is 2020. It wasn't always sunny in 2020, but it was in 2016. Um, so when things go perfectly, you can have a bit of fun. We all know 2020 wasn't the greatest. So here's a screenshot from one of our WebEx meetings in class. We had to do a lot of classes. We had to wear masks, but yet people had time to dress their cats up in silly clothes and we laughed about that in class. So, you know, that affected the experience of these students uh, during the summer. We didn't get to meet in person, which is really hard to teach somebody vineyard management when we're not out in the vineyard. But it was a, we made the best out of the situation. And you can see these two, you know, usually I don't let people spray water at each other, but this was obviously a mutual uh, fun thing to do. So late at night when we're cleaning up, let the hair down a little bit. So that's, oh, and this is at 20, this is 2020 at, at Silver Thread. Um, again, just beautiful grapes. And here's our under vine cover crop, stealing water from the vines and making them stress a little bit more. You can see these vines didn't grow very much. And that was a function of the stress, even though we were irrigating constantly in both 2020 and 2016. Um, one other thing that happened in 2016 that is kind of a landmark at Silver Thread, we had this puddle in the vineyard at one point and we cut early in the season in April before it ever got, well, it was pretty dry in April. It was one of the drier Aprils ever too. Uh, we cut a, a drainage tile through the vineyard and we had to cut all these wires. Um, and drainage is one of those things that we have to do in the vineyard because we have to be prepared for water. Even though we didn't use this drainage very much in 2016, uh, it drains the excess uh, water that's in the soil down to field capacity faster so you don't get puddles in the vineyard and standing water. And uh, close to where Aaron uh, here is chipping away at rocks to try and make a slope for the water to get out behind him, downhill is in front of him, by the way, um, is a spring in the vineyard. So for years and years, we're going to grow grapes uphill of here. And in 2016 is when we finally installed that drainage to make that possible. Uh, so these photos are a good teaching lesson to students. Don't plant a vineyard unless you have the drainage right, because it's really hard to put the drainage in after the fact. We probably cut three, 400 wires and had to mend them um, then. And then, of course, in good years, we can have fun. Here's my son having fun in the vineyard. That's not my vineyard, I don't think, but it's a vineyard in the Finger Lakes and we're having fun. So, um, so that's 2016 and 2020. I will unplug my good audio and go to my bad audio and ask Al and maybe a minute to ask questions. So 2016, I'll say this while we're waiting for Ellie to get questions, um, was the warmest year, or I mean, sorry, it was the driest year ever recorded in the Finger Lakes. Uh, there never, you know, the, the driest year before that occurred, I think it was 71, uh, which is odd. I think the uh, flood was 72, 
there was a flood in 72, but it wasn't near what the flood was in 2018. Uh, but it did affect the Grateful Dead concert down at Watkins Glen, and that's kind of a historical issue. But the, the, the year without rain was in early 70s, and that wasn't, I think they got 15 inches during the growing season, and in 20... 16 we only got what 10 on the graph that i showed you and i know that we only got seven here at silver thread um and keep that in mind too we got seven inches between april and october total in 2018 on august 14th we got 11 inches in six hours um these are extremes this is that climate change uh discussion we we're having before this, this is the result of climate change that we're having these extremes and basically years that are so close together. I mean, 2016, you know, these are only two, two years removed from each other. Um, you know, going from really warm and dry to monsoon and humid back to warm and dry. Uh, so will we have wet years again? Yeah, we'll have wet years again. Will we have cool years again? Yeah, we'll get to that. And we'll have, you know, warm years again. So go ahead, Alan. Did you yeah go ahead yeah you're pretty you're pretty much answering one of the questions so christopher batterick i don't know if i'm saying his name right he said might this be the new normal with climate change so with what with climate change like yes. might this, yeah yeah it's the extremes and we just I'll, I'll divert a little bit here um the Finger Lakes has always been a challenging climate to grow grapes and make wine in because it's we've always had variation from year to year. And there's always been a saying in the wine the wine industry, even back to the 80s, uh, was it? There's a Napa Valley winery, Frog's Leap, who was, it was founded by, I think he's a, yeah, he's a Cornell graduate and he made wine in the Finger Lakes for a while. He, I don't know, he bought a motorcycle with the last money he had and drove to California, sold the motorcycle and bought property that became Frog's Leap. But he would always tell his colleagues, like, we got it made here. This is easy to make wine here. You should, if you want to learn how to make wine, you need to go to the Finger Lakes and make wine for a few years because you'll get something different every year. And that's what really gives me hope as a wine ma maker and an educator is that we have to be open to all of these discussions. When we're having a dry year, I've got to remind the students that we can have wet years. When we're having a wet year, I've got to remind the students that we're going to have dry years. And the types of things we have to do in the cellar to make wine changes from year to year. The amount of work we have to put in to make the quality of wine that our customers expect changes from year to year. And we're just used to that. We're used to that already. And now maybe we just have to dig a little bit deeper and figure out ways to make our vines more resilient um, so that we can continue doing what we've always done um, and what we've gotten really good at doing. So dwelling on that a little bit. How am I doing on time, Allie? Because I can't see a clock. Anymore. It is 7.51. 7.51, oh my gosh, okay. I'll be quick on this one. <laughs> uh, if anybody has to go. <laughs> um, so 14, 17, and 19, I grouped together because these years got really cold in late August and early September. And what that what happens in mid-August is that the grapes go, go through something called veraison. And at that point uh, in the season, we experience a rapid accumulation of sugar and a decrease in acid. So mid-August veraison, increase in sugar, decrease in veraison. Well, when it's cold, we don't get that. So I always remind people of 2017, because what happened right before it got cold? Well, we had the solar eclipse, and that's what my daughter and I are doing. We're looking at the solar eclipse safely with our glasses on. Um, and that was, oh, it was like August 20th or something. And like August 22nd, there was a frost in the Adirondacks. Uh, there was, it got down into the 20s, and it was cold across the state in the Northeast, and it stayed that way for like two weeks. Um, I'll just use this quote now. These years were challenging because that cold weather in late August and early September, really in each of these years, and I'll show you in a minute, lasted for 30 days. Um, at the end of 2019, as challenging as that was, uh, the overwhelming thought in the Finger Lakes wine community 
was at least this wasn't 2018. Because <laughs> that was 2019. It was so much better than 20. It will take a year like that any year over a year like 2018. So uh, this is just some weather data showing um, August above at, or July above average and August was cooler. That was 2019. Um, and then August cooler in 2017. And then in 2014, same thing. August cool. Actually, 2014, it was cool the whole time, but being cool in August really hurt. Um, and I don't have, uh, well, this is a 2019 growing degree day accumulation. We got really, like, we were way down in 2019. And then we got close to average. And then the end of August came and we just lost a lot of heat. So this is, average would have been a flat line from here. And it just got cold. Um, and it stayed cold. It didn't warm up again until mid-September. So for a month, we were below average uh, with temperature, which really hurts our ripening for the grapes. So we're just kind of in this steady state of delay. And we're sampling the grapes, and the students go out and sample their grapes that they're making wine with every week, and the numbers don't change that much. And they don't start off very good as it is. Um, so we deal with it. Uh, you can see cloudy years, uh, both 2014 and 2017, we had an abnormally wet uh, July too, and we had some disease pressure. 2019, we didn't have that much disease pressure. We had some. Um, this is a shout out to some of my students here. This is Devin Showmaker, who owns Rooftop Reds. And I put him in this presentation, and oddly enough, he texted me yesterday. Uh, shortly after I put him in this presentation. So his mind must have been itching. But he owns Rooftop Reds, graduated from the program back in 2013, started this vineyard on a rooftop in Brooklyn. So if you're ever in Brooklyn, you can go visit Devin. Um, when he first came to me with the idea, I said, there's no way you can do that. And that's not how we grow grapes, and that's not how we learn how to grow grapes, so you're not going to do your projects on that. Well, by the end, I was letting him do the projects on it, and now I put my foot in my mouth because he's got a rooftop vineyard and uh, plans to have many more. So that's Devin. Here's some uh, really clean grapes and some not so clean grapes from 2017. Uh, so there was a mixed bag. Uh, we made some beautiful wine out of these grapes. Um, and sometimes even when things aren't so bad or they could be worse, uh, your tractor breaks. So here's one of my tractors towing my other tractor out of the field after uh, it leaked all of its oil out. So things like that happen in the wine industry and we have to use them as learning experiences. Um, but yet we get to go to cool places. This is us actually in Cornell's teaching, vin or teaching winery on the upper left. And then from bottom left, uh, counterclockwise, this is us at Bill Bully Hill. Uh, so this is at Pleasant Valley. And this is us at Canandaigua Wine Company. Uh, formerly Constellation, now Gallo. And actually, this is the head winemaker to the left of that picture. He's still the head winemaker uh, now to Gallo facility. But, you know, our students get to go to some really cool places and see small wineries and large wineries. And as a faculty member at FLCC, they actually let me take a sabbatical uh, back in 2017. So I threw these pictures in just to say, I went to New Zealand. I participated with other classes that are similar to FLCC there. In February and March, it's actually where I was at this time in 2017, and I uh, got to meet up with and hang out with for a few days. Uh, Jamie Tucker, who was another one of our graduates at the time, uh, she was in her third year of being the enologist at Craggy Range Vineyard, which is in Hawkes Bay. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of our uh, successful graduates. Here I am on a glacier, which is cool to walk on a glacier because they might not be there. Uh, in 2005, my wife and I were in New Zealand also, and we saw this glacier, and it was over a mile longer in 2005 than it was in 2017. And I remember calling her and saying, it's $250 to walk on the glacier. And she said, Paul, next time you go there, it might not be there. Again, because of climate change. And she said, just spend the money and walk on the glacier. So I said, I'm going to go walk on the glacier. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I got to hang out with classes there. These are two classes in Hawks, uh, um, Central Otago, which is very southern part, one of the most southern wine growing regions in the world. And they have a lot of frost problems there. And so it's a windmill there. 
to move the air when it gets really cold. And this is actually up in Hawks Bay. And Jamie actually came to the class with us that day and she was uh, helping to dig a soil pit in this uh, gimbal gravel, uh, which is a very famous uh, soil and vineyard type in Hawks Bay. So we got to do that and it was really neat to bring some of those experiences back uh, to my classroom. So without further ado, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, what do numbers look like? I've talked a lot about numbers, but here's some of the vari variation um, in sugar. So, uh, sorry, on the bottom of these two are sugar from various years. And you can just see how the sugar accumulation changes from year to year, and the dotted line is average. So winemakers have to be able to make wine with all these different things that throw at us. So, I've, you know, I've talked a lot about what happened in those years and what we talked about. Well, these are the chemical numbers or chemistry behind what the winemakers had to deal with at the end of the season. So this is a nice graph just showing the past four years, and just how different each year was. Um, now I didn't talk about 2015 much, but I will in just a second. That was an average year. And you can see it almost follows the average ripening curve for Riesling. <laughs> Actually, uh, there's a credit. Um, I just wanted to mention the other years in the past decade. 2011 was the rainiest that we've ever seen between August 15th and Oct the end of October. It never, we never had three dry days in a row. Um, so I didn't talk about that today. That was a thing. That was one of my first years at FLCC, my first year owning Silver Thread, and that's what I had to deal with um, as a winemaker and trying to teach students was, it's not supposed to be this rainy, it's not supposed to be this cloudy, and it was really warm too. So. It wasn't as bad as 2018, but it was as bad as it got up until that point. Um, 2012 was another one of those really perfect years, uh, a little bit more rain than 20, 2016, 2020. Uh, 2013 was one of the warmest years, but it was cloudy. Um, and then, as I just said, 2015 was just an average year, whatever that means, because all these extremes, we don't really know what the average is anymore, but 2015 was average. And it was kind of refreshing to have that stuck in the middle of the past decade. Um, I just threw this picture in. These, these are locust posts that I'm gonna be installing in my vineyard, I'm trying to get away from using pressure treated wood. Um, so they're not pretty posts, but they actually last longer than pressure treated. I've got locust posts in my woods that have been there since the vineyards there were abandoned in 1935 after that flood that I referenced earlier. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight and, and I'm sure I went over a little bit. I want to thank my, my grateful uh, employer, uh, Finger Lakes Community College. Thank you for having me. I'm grateful to you uh, for having me and Honeyway Valley Association. Um, and of course, Allie, thank you very much. Um, and if you're ever interested in following me on Instagram, I am at Silver Thread Winemaker. And I've got two email addresses. So depending on what you want from me, I can take either email at either one. So cheers, guys. Questions? Thank you, Paul. Um, let's see. I think one just came through. Hold on. Oh, great presentation. Many thanks. Um, I think Gina had a question about irrigation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you recommend any new vineyard so install? So when I am installing vineyards, I do recommend irrigation, not just for the super dry years, but young vines will always benefit from irrigation if you install it and we get one of these dry years. And we never quite know if we're going to get a dry year, so it's always a good investment because it'll pay for itself tenfold if you have it and you need it. So if you're on a shallow site like I am, irrigation is absolutely mandatory. Anything I else? Have a, I have a question. Oh, actually, Bruce has a question. Hold on. How right. serious, how serious a concern? Yes, actually, I have the same question as Bruce. How serious a concern is the invasion of spotted lanternfly? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so spotted lanternfly is an invasive species that was introduced to the United States. It's from uh, China, uh, eastern part of China. Um, it was introduced to the area around Philadelphia and has grown from there. 
Uh, and actually, Bruce has helped me uh, understand this uh, by involving me with some uh, invasive, invasive species folks around New York State. Uh, so I'm grateful to Bruce for that. Uh, Cornell Crawford Extension and Penn State have been very involved with containing it and helping to set up quarantines as the insect spreads. Um, so they have slowed the spread because uh, if they had they not done anything, it, it would have been here already. So what it does is it attaches the vine and directly sucks the phloem out of the vine, usually during the ripening period. So all the times that I was talking to you about. And uh, it can really weaken the vine because it's sucking all the phloem um, out. And the phloem is where the sugar is and the vine. And it just really poops it out the other end. So it's a, it's a continuous pump of just taking stuff out of the vine. Uh, and they kind of swarm on a vine. Uh, so is it coming to the Finger Lakes? Yeah, I truly believe it is coming to the Finger Lakes. Uh, I thought, it, you know, had you asked me two years ago, I probably would have said 2021 was the year. And maybe we'll start seeing it here. There, But again, I have faith in the people that are trying to contain it. I um, keep my eye out for it. I know other, you know, we're trying the Cornell Cooperative Extension is trying to educate our industry of what to look for. Uh, number one thing people can do is be aware, especially if they're traveling through Pennsylvania and other mid-Atlantic states where the spotted lanternfly is. It likes to hitchhike on cars. Uh, be aware that it's there. Uh, search your car before you leave those areas uh, so you don't park in your home in the Finger Lakes and inadvertently introduce spotted lanternfly to the Finger Lakes. So, yes, it's coming. I think we're going to be able to deal with it. Again, you know, I, I mentioned growing our vines more resiliently during the presentation. That is another huge reason why we need to grow our vines resiliently is because the spotted lanternfly will more than likely be here at some point and a stronger, healthier vine will be more resilient than a weaker vine. So we'll, we'll figure it out. I can't hear you, Allie, you're muted. <laughs> Oops. Um, do you think you can stop sharing your screen? I do have like a, an image of oh, yeah. a spotted, spotted lantern for oh, yeah. everybody. It's a tattoo, actually. <laughs> yeah, I have several of those. And actually, you can put those on a notebook as a sticker, too. You just make it work. Oh, nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, so that's what the adult looks like. And it's mm -hmm. really more important to know how to identify the egg masses and the nymphs. Yep. So spotted lantern fly, I think, has its own website in New York State, so you can look it up. Um, it is a beautiful bug. It uh, is but not one that we want to see alive. We do have one more question. Um, sure. Do you think biodynamic methods might pick up in finger in the Finger Lakes? Just a fad of pseudoscience. <laughs> I don't necessarily think it's a fad. Uh, Herman Weimer Vineyard is being uh, successful. Actually, they had a biodynamic vineyard in 2018 and. I always bring my students there. Um, the people at Weimer are friends of mine, and um, they do things differently than other wineries, uh, including organic and biodynamic viticulture. In 2018, their cleanest grapes came out of their biodynamic vineyard. And as I showed you, my cleanest grapes came out of my biointensive vineyard, which biointensive is not biodynamic. Um, so there's something going on there that allowed them to do that. And of course, they also manage some vineyards with integrated pest management and conventional materials. Um, so it's not going away. Uh, not, it's not going to be adopted wholesale across the Finger Lakes. Um, there's a lot of wishy-washy stuff with biodynamics, but there might be some really useful things about biodynamics that people can use also. And some people might dive into it head over heels, which I know there are some people interested. I think uh, it's a little bit easier with apples, and I know a lot of a lot more apple growers who are currently doing it than grape growers. And even with biodynamics being successful in some years, you still have, you're still losing crops crop in the more challenging years. So Yes, it's successful. It can be done. Um, I don't think it's going to be done widely. It's a good question, though. I'll show the picture of the spotted lantern fly again. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That's about the size it is, too, compared to Elliot's hand. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it is. <laughs> 
Um, do you try to enhance the organic matter content in your vineyard soil to essentially improve moisture retention? So, yeah, you know, we tried some different things. Uh, well, we're, we've, over the past five years, I've been growing undervine cover crops uh, and we haven't sprayed any herbicides and we haven't tilled. Um, and, you know, we've managed cover crops and whatever weeds grow by just uh, string trimming them. So we've been returning that organic matter. Uh, we, bet, we always put hay bales out. Uh, but what I've noticed over the past several years is that my vines are being out-competed with the cover crop, and especially in the year like 2020, it did my vines no good to have that cover crop under my vines. It's a perennial cover crop. So we're now going to a system of uh, minimal tillage, uh, a lot more compost. We've always put compost down, but we're gonna be doing more compost. Uh, and whenever we have exposed earth, because I do plan on planting annuals every year at the right time, so they're not competing with, you know, I'm gonna let the vine grow and then let the annuals grow. Um, so I have something covering the ground over the winter time and in the spring, but not between uh, the beginning of the growing season uh, and uh, August. So uh, to hold the soil together, because I'm definitely afraid of something like 2018 happening again, because I, I suffer from PTSD over that event. I don't know if you guys could tell. Um, the soil held together so the, there was a pile of um wood chips and right next to each other and they're both within the ground flow uh pretty severe ground flow after the flood was over there was no gravel anymore but the 90 percent of the wood chips were still there and it that macro lesson really showed me how important it is to have the soil biology making aggregates in the soil um, because aggregates help keep soil together when there is um, runoff potential. And uh, having organic stuff there to kind of glue it together. So if we do have surface water, that soil is less likely to wash away. Uh, so yeah, I'm actively trying to encourage more organic matter in the vineyard, even though we're gonna be ending the perennial fescue uh, experiment and moving in a different direction. So it's kind of a long-winded answer. I'm famous for long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> we do have another question if you're up for some yeah, more. Absolutely. Okay. Um, can, you, <laughs> can you speak at all on the mic mycorrhizal treatments through your vineyard. From your observations, did that help with moisture retention this past growing season? Uh, so I don't have anywhere in my vineyard anymore where I don't have mycorrhizae, uh, where I haven't inoculated. And I also, it's an interesting, so we did inoculate with mycorrhizal fungi. I've also used Korean farming methods to um, collect some of the fungi that is, are in our hedgerow that has never been farmed, and I've distributed those in our vineyard. Um, I have not tested for how much mycorrhizae is in our vineyard compared to other vineyards. Uh, there is some proposals at Cornell to study uh, what those look like, what it looks like, because uh, there is a very different situation here, silver so thread, than up on the hill in some of my neighbors and how they're farming using pesticides and cultivation under their vines. Um, so there's interest in that. We're really just beginning to understand that where in some vineyards, Justine Bannon Label did a experiment a few years ago where she inoculated some places and left some places uninoculated. We were actually part of that study and she found in all cases where there's mycorrhizae, those vines had more nutrients um, and had a better nutrient status within the vine than in the places that the, we didn't have the mycorrhizae. And just, I'll end after I say this, uh, grapevines don't have root hairs, so they rely on mycorrhizal fungi to get the, fine, the, the micronutrients and even water out of the soil more efficiently. So even though vineyards might use herbicides and till, they still have to have mycorrhizae under their vines um, because vines rely on it. 
So it's there. It's just a matter of promoting that growth. Um, so I've even got the question, do we need to inoculate or can we just do better practices to encourage what is already endemic to the site? So it's a good question. I think that this is a, a good final question <laughs> from Bruce. From Bruce. Um, what's your hope for the 2021 growing season? Best vintage ever. <laughs> So, I'll, I'll, so, and one thing I didn't talk about much was the overwinter temperatures. I didn't mention 13, 14, 14, 50. We've had a very mild winter in the Finger Lakes, and I know a lot of people would throw stuff at me for saying that because we're coming out of, what, over three weeks in a row where it never got above freezing, but it also never got below zero uh, in most places where there's vineyards. So this is 2020, 2021 growing season. Any growing season after a warm, sunny growing season is going to be very large crop because our, our inflorescent uh, uh, primordia develop in the bud uh, June, July of the previous season. So our uh, fruit potential is already in the vineyard. It's been there since August and it was very well developed. In sunny years, our fruit potential gets very well developed. In cloudy years, it doesn't get very well developed. So in 2013, after 2012, and in 2017, after 2016, we're the two biggest crops Springer Lakes has ever seen. So the two sunniest, warmest years um, were followed by the largest crop. Uh, in order to make that largest crop happen, we have to have a mild winter, which so far we have had, not have wood. Um, so we make it through the next month or so, we get through May without a frost that kills our buds, and we have a potential for an enormous crop. We're going to need a lot of sunshine, we're going to need some water to support the vines and the sunshine, and 2021 is going to be great. It's going to be lots of grapes, lots of good grapes, it's going to be awesome. So thank you guys again for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Paul. I just knocked on all the wood surrounding me. so 2021 is going to be a good year um Thanks. thank you thank you again and thank you everybody that joined us tonight um i just wanted to remind you that our next speaking of nature is going to be on thursday march 25th at 6 p.m and it's going to be on the hellbender salamander so i hope you can join us for that and have a great night everybody thank you Thanks.